Sure. So, um, hi, I'm Kim Gans. I'm a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences, and I'm really excited about Dr. Thurston's talk today. So I'm just going to introduce her. Um, Idia Benitier Thurston is Professor of Health Sciences and Applied Psychology and Associate Director of the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research at Northeastern University. Her research explores causes of health inequity among adolescents, young adults, and parents by examining how and why Black Indigenous, people of color, and other minoritized individuals experience a greater health and disease burden. Framed by an academic womanist lens, her research explores multi-level individual, individual relational and contextual risk and protective factors that contribute to varying health outcomes among minoritized and underserved populations. She's deeply invested in the development of a diverse workforce of health scientists via the Change Lab, where she supports grad, post back and undergrad scholars to engage in health equity science, social justice advocacy, and cultural humility practices. Her lab strives to combat health inequity by engaging with communities to develop strength-based, culturally responsive tools, programs, and interventions to enhance well-being, reduce stigma, and promote self-empowerment. She prioritizes research that explores intersectional identities of race, ethnicity, gender, class, age, and sexuality. Uh, I will remind attendees, uh, we're going to hold questions until the end, but if you think of questions during her talk, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and then we'll get to those at the end. Um, so the title of her talk is Multi-Level Factors, Contributing to Health Inequity in Pediatric Populations. So welcome, Dr. Thurston. Thank you so much. Um, it is an honor to be here. I'm so grateful for the invitation to present to you all. Um, I am glad to see folks uh, in the in the uh, WebEx room, virtual room, um, as I speak to you from Boston today. Um, I um, just want to uh, center identities that I bring into this space, in this room. As a Black immigrant woman, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live and work on the native lands of the Massachusetts, um, Pataka, Wapanak, and um, Pakanaket peoples. Um, and it's important to me as an immigrant person to talk about the lands on which I stand and live and work um, because land is so important. And I believe this is a continued uh, journey and struggle. We need to partner with um, Indigenous communities um, around giving land back to indigenous people. Um, I also um, am someone who um, is engaging in research with communities. So I'll talk um, some about that work today. But to get us started, um, I uh, want to pose a question. So hopefully um, this works for folks to put responses in the chat. And um, my question to you is, how would you get this car out? I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'm going to try to find where the chat uh, button is. And if I can't, I might lean on Kim to tell me about some of the things that show up in the chat. Because um, I think because I'm sharing screen, I'm not seeing the chat anywhere. So just if you put in the, in the box ideas of how you would get this car out. Okay, I see something that says help from another vehicle. Yeah, sorry, I was on okay. mute. I was Perfect. reading them out and then I realized <laughs> I was on mute. Um, call AAA, tow truck, um, help from another vehicle, uh, tow truck, yeah. Okay. Any other ideas? I want to make sure if there's anything else that... Um, call my that dad. Okay. Get a group <laughs> of a people one. to push it out. Teamwork. I love the I love the engaging community in doing this. That's that's lovely. Like leaning on people you trust and who can help you. Um, a pulley that have good boots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also like the the engineer the you know engineering mind thinking of a pulley system. I've had people pulley say system. like get oh, yeah, get the plank and push it along. Right. That's great. Okay. So lots of awesome ideas. Um, thank you for participating. I know it's not always easy on virtual. Okay, so I'm going to, um, let's see, play this for a second.
Okay, so hopefully people got to got to see. Um, again, this is this is much tougher online, but um, so the the what what I just showed was a child picking up the car. So um, as you look through the chat, no one put that as an option, right? I think because many of us probably got in a car to drive to where we went to. We um, we we often use transportation, right, as as a source to get from place to place. And I use that to start conversations about um, thinking about health equity because um, as a clinician, I'm a clinical psychologist by training and as a researcher, many times because we're trained in academia, we have this sense of um, knowing and that um, often we approach questions and issues from our own lens. And I really like um, this little video as a way for us to think about context more. So as you see the image on the left, it looks like the thing in the far off looks like a tree. So there are things in the image that sort of make us lean one way about what the picture is about, right? And so part of um, part of doing this type of equity work is really trying to um, hold space for what perspectives we're not seeing, right? Like. Um, what, wh who, whose voices are we not seeing? What perspectives are we not seeing? How does context affect um, what we're seeing or not seeing? And to challenge us to really think more about missing pieces, missing voices in the room, um, what context we're missing, and what, how our perception of what we think things are might be preventing us from seeing the full picture. So, um, the the lens, I'd like to um, start our conversation with that and also thinking about cultural competence versus cultural humility. So cultural competence is a perspective that often implies a discrete endpoint. And in doing health equity work, we're really thinking about working with different communities. And so we know that community often changes on a daily basis. And so competence has this idea of a discrete endpoint versus cultural humility is really a commitment for active engagement in a lifelong process that involves critical self-reflection and learning, lifelong learning. It involves recognizing and challenging power imbalances that we see, whether it's engaging in patient-focused interviewing and care strategies, things like reflective listening. So we're really hearing what people's experiences are from their own perspective, um, community-based, and engage research and advocacy, which I'll talk a lot more about, and then also institutional accountability. So really thinking about what is our institution doing to uphold these principles and these ideas. Um, and this is work from um, Melanie Turvalon and Dr. Murray Gar Garcia, um, where they talk really about cultural competence and cultural humility, um, particularly in the context of healthcare training. And um, this is really a lens that I hope we can bring into the rest of this talk, really thinking about how are we pushing for cultural humility in these different areas. So the um, goals of my talk today will be to define um, what I mean by multi-level factors, to describe four core areas of how we can implement this multi-level um, examination of, um, of issues from PEAR, which I'll describe what those are in a little bit, and then um, how we develop an implementation plan using PEAR. So again, at the end, we'll engage in some activity um, participation um, through the chat. So starting with defining multi-level factors. Um, so when I think about multi-level factors, we're really thinking about first with the individual level. So what are the factors that are located um, within the individual? So things in this category might be um, health condition of an individual, an individual's social identities like race, ethnicity, gender, um, but also things like ethnic identity and how people connect with their culture um, from an individual lens. So you, you think of Nemo on its own, right? And then when you think about relational factors, so you can see now that individual factor is embedded within this larger relational context. So we see um, this individual is functioning within a system um, of relationships with other folks. So these are factors that directly influence the child and their development. Um, often there's a direct relationship between the child and those factors. So these might be the parenting or caregiver relationships they have and how that interaction happens. Um, the teachers or coaches, right, and relationships with those individuals, medical providers, et cetera. 
And then when we add in the next level of the contextual level, these are factors that um, directly and indirectly influence the child's environment. So these might be environments that touch the child directly, but they also may be factors that don't touch the child directly. So things like a parent's work environment, right? We know that if a parent has to work two jobs or work late, that affects the child indirectly. Um, but also things like the neighborhood that the child lives within, the types of resources that um, that the child might have. So we, again, think about all these different levels and the environment policies that impact the child. So um, we'll be th thinking about um, youth functioning across these different levels. So as we, um, as we position this work within context, the first is to consider what, um, what, what these concepts of um, equity, as I, as I talk about health equity, what those things are. So this, amazing illustration really talks about um, the differences between equity, equality, and I'll go through each of these. So the first one talks about what in inequality is, and this is unequal access to opportunities. So as, as you see on one side, the person is getting fruit from the tree. On the right side, the person is not getting access to the fruit on the tree. And as you can see, also the tree is leaning in one direction. Equality is really this idea of having evenly distributed tools and assistance. So um, you see that both individuals now have a ladder that are the same size. And um, while it helps the person um, on the left, right, they're able to reach those resources without sort of waiting for them to drop. On the right hand side, you see that that person is still not able to get access to the resources, the apples on the tree. And so even though this person has, um, uh, has a tool, the tool is not really working for them. And then when we think about equity, this is where we have custom tools. So the person on the right has a taller ladder because they have a harder time reaching those resources on the tree compared to the person on the right. And so most of um, my training, um, both on the psychology side and public health side, you know, we'll get to this point of equity. What I really love about this particular image is the addition of this piece around justice. And justice really talks about how um, you engage in additional tools. So as you, as you can see, um, on the left side, there are tools to push the tree so that the tree is, is standing more upright. And on the right side, there's um, tools pulling the tree. And also, if you notice, like both people on each side now have same size ladder. So the idea is that when you fix the structure or the system, that institutional component, you then can have similar resources, right? But part of it is fixing that structure that exists. And so um, that, this, this piece around justice, I think, has really shaped um, a lot of the way I'm thinking about health equity and how, what are we doing? What, are we, what tools are we bringing in to fix the tree or the structures that exist? Um, some other factors that matter to this work is um, social determinants or social drivers of health. And social drivers of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these are um, often, you know, luck of the draw, if you will, right? You're born into these environments, you have access to these resources, or you don't have access to those resources. What we know from a public health perspective is that these social drivers of health affect various health outcomes from mortality, morbidity, um, life expectancy, how much is spent on health care, functional limitation. So across different areas, we find that social determinants uh, or social drivers, as um, more preferred newer term, um, that they affect the health of individuals across these different levels, from economic supports to neighborhood and built environment, um, the type of food access, all the way through the healthcare system and access to the healthcare system. Um, the third component that I'll bring into the conversation is the history of the U.S. So this is one often that is sometimes hard for folks to process or um, think about, but it is part of the reality of our U.S. history and often is history that we, um, we did not uh, directly impact, but it's what we've inherited, right? And so um, here I talk about the history of Black enslavement. Um, in the U.S., where you see from 1619 to 1865, we had um, laws and policies that allowed um, Black folks in this country to be enslaved. And then 
from 1877 through 1969, there was um, implementation of Jim, Jim Crow policies, right? These were laws that, again, did not allow um, Black individuals to have full citizenship or rights in the country. So um, this I learned from a scholar, a race scholar, Joe Fagan, who's at Texas A&M University. And what this really had me shift a little bit in my thinking around you know, adding these numbers together, you see that 82% of the U.S. history is baked in these policies that prevented individuals from having full rights of citizenship. So what does that mean? That means that 82% um, of our history involves state-sanctioned exclusion and violence towards members of our community. And again, I'm not saying this to make anyone feel bad or shame or guilt, but as because as a psychologist, we know that shame and guilt, they don't, don't inspire change. Um, but I'm doing this to remind us of the legacy of this history. And so for us to be thinking about how is this operating today? So I think rather than wondering, is racism operating here? I think the question we need to ask is how is racism operating? Because Frankly, how could it not be when 82% of our history is baked in this in this experience? Um, and because of the nature of exclusion that happened with that 82% of our history, we need to also ask whose voices are not being centered and how can we bring those voices into the room? And so um, this is like, you know, I, I think a, a, a thing that I challenge myself to think about and I um, would love us to be challenging ourselves so we can bring those voices and those perspectives into the room. Okay, so that's a sense of like um, constructs that I'll be using throughout the talk so that we're clear on the same page in terms of language. Now thinking about the four areas of implementation. So um, this uh, is a way for, I use PAIR as an acronym to think about um, uh, different areas of practice or different areas of ways in which we work. So the first of which is practice. So again, as a clinical psychologist, I think about application. How does this work with individual relationships with individuals? The second is education. So I'm also a scholar and I teach courses to undergraduates and graduate students. So how do we think about these multi-level factors in um, the education context? Um, the third is advocacy, which again, for my field is an area that we often don't get a lot of um, training in, but is one in which many of us might do work um, on the side or like to get our research out into the world, there's a piece of advocacy in that. And so how do we think about these constructs in that, um, in that concept of advocacy? And then the fourth is research. So um, PAIR, which is a, a acronym we came up with through um, the Society of Pediatric Psychology, really just to help us think about any policy, any, any um, research we're doing, how are we thinking about implication across these four areas? So I'll start with talking about practice. So I'm going to overlap care, so practice, education, advocacy, and research with this multi-level approach. So thinking about at the individual level, at the relational level, and then also at the contextual level. So when we think about practice, one of the areas as a practitioner is the ways in which our implicit biases and our limited cultural humility might be influencing what types of questions we're asking of folks, um, what we're missing, who's not in the room. Um, and so as practitioners really like centering that. And so part of why I started that conversation with cultural humility so that we're practicing this as we're thinking about um, the different um, factors that come up for us when we're working with families or communities. The second is really family structure. So thinking about family composition, um, single parent households, we know that um, increased um, risk for adverse childhood um, events in um, different family structure, um, uh, different family structures. And so that's something we need to be thinking about and asking questions around um, so we can ensure that we're providing resources, um, supporting families to get resources based on the different family structures that they're experiencing. And the third level, when we think about contextual factors, um, we think about neighborhood level stressors. So where the environments that people are living, what's the degree of safety and social support that they're getting, what the experiences of um, neighborhood segregation that they're having. I mentioned about exposure to childhood adversities. So um, we think about it as how families, but also from a contextual level, right? If you're living in certain neighborhoods, you have increased levels of exposure to childhood adversities, and then also socioeconomic status. So what are the um, type of resources that are available in that community? 
As someone who's a strength-based researcher, I also like to think about what are the resources that people have. So again, I think about this idea of individual, relational, and contextual, but thinking about what are the protective mechanisms that underlie um, some of these disparities, that if we increase those these factors, we can um, help support people who are experiencing multi-level risk factors. So one of, at the individual level, we've seen um, multiple studies show that positive racial and ethnic identity is seen as a protective factor against adversity. So this is um, something that we as providers need to be thinking about. What are we doing? How are we talking to families and youth around their racial identity? What supports and tools do they need around racial identity, racial socialization? Um, because these are, these are known protective factors against um, adversity and um, disparities and inequities. Um, at the relational level, we have having higher levels of social support and having um, stable parental mental health. So again, as providers, are we supporting parents around their mental health and their well-being? Because we know that those are protective factors for young people at that relational level. And then at the contextual level, um, there are things around having a positive home and school environment and then religious and community involvement. So really thinking about ways that we can support families to increase supports in these areas. What are we doing to assess their current level of um, the home environment, resources in the school environment, and then how can we support increased engagement in these, in these factors? So those are things thinking really as a on the practice level as um, practitioners, um, things that we can be thinking about and ways to um, support our, our um, folks that we're working with in that way. So I'll switch now to education and thinking about um, teaching and um, training of mentees. And here I'm highlighting um, a recent study that colleagues and I um, uh, produced called Upending Racism in Psychological Science. And part of what we focused on is um, different strategies to, to think about how racism shows up in how we conduct our science, we report our science, we review our science and disseminate our science. And there's a QR code here if you want to access that article. But um, this, I'll, I'll talk about, we, we provide 25 strategies that folks can think about when wanting to address um, ways in which racism shows up in our research but I'm gonna highlight just three of them across those multi-level um, areas um, as, we, as we proceed along in the talk. So at the individual level, what are some factors that we can engage in to address this, thinking again about the education sector? So one, um, one of the recommendations that we give is the use of system-centered language. So system-centered language is a way in which we frame um, people's experiences by talking about the systems that created those experiences. So I've talked about some of those systems like social drivers of health, like our history of racism and um, in this country. Um, so some of these systems and um, factors that are driving health outcomes, we want to center that in our, in our language and how we write about families. And I'll give you an example of what that might look like. But part of on the educational level is training students on using system-centered language, having them practice writing in that way, um, and then also updating author guidelines to require use of system-centered language. And some, some exciting p um, aspects of this work is that some journals have started to address this in their publication guidelines and really encouraging of system-centered language, which is really encouraging to see. So this is an example. So rather than saying, for example, HIV disproportionately affects Black and Latino MSM or men who have sex with men, a, a different framing of this that really talks about how systems are driving this rates would be something like HIV systematically impacts Black and Latino MSM who often face barriers such as medical racism, cost of sexual transmitted um, infections or HIV testing and PrEP. Right, so we're saying why they have that risk and not just stopping at these individuals have that risk, which has the um, unintended effect of labeling those individuals as broken in some way or problematic in some way. But when you put the system, then it helps you understand why these things are happening in that way. And so use of system-centered language in our writing really engages in that practice of doing that. At the relational level, here we're highlighting work with um, communities. And I'm highlighting this um, work by um, colleagues, um, Dr. Wilford and several others um, who are also pediatric psychologists who really think about how psychologists 
um, can be leaders in equitable science and thinking about how we engage with, um, with communities um, in doing um, clinical trials and behavioral uh, medicine trials. And so part of this relational level is how we work with community partners to disseminate findings, um, not just disseminating in journal articles, but really thinking about um, disseminating research outside of journals and working with in like um, putting things in community newsletters and um, other such resources so that people can um, learn about the findings that we've that we've worked so hard to, to, to research. Maybe we've worked with communities to come up with these ideas, but how do we get those, um, those ideas into the communities that we're trying to serve? And then encouraging community partners really to be as co-authors um, in the work that we do. Um, at the contextual level, um, this is an example of a research study by, um, by uh, Dr. Galan, who talks about how we can engage in advocacy to change our science. So um, thinking about uh, different ways in which we review our candidates, how we work with um, candidates to build a track record, um, in um, thinking about the equitable environments in which they work, even when we're um, hi um, hiring editors for journals, but also looking at our journal leadership and how are we um, promoting equity in the science that we're creating. And then looking at um, journal metrics when we think about BIPOC or Black Indigenous People of Color presence and authorship editorial um, content. So again, just really trying to change the context in which we're producing science and we're training people in science. Um, I'll talk next about advocacy at the individual level. Part of the work is doing some critical self-reflection. So asking questions to ourselves about the roles in which we that we play in advancing health equity. Um, thinking about how our work detracts or adds to health equity initiatives, having that sort of self-examination lens, and then also exploring what skills that we have as individuals to support health equity. And part of the goal in looking at our skills is saying where are the gaps that we don't have so we can develop skills in those areas. So again, these are individual questions we can ask, ask ourselves. At the relational level, identifying and elevating the needs of community organizations, so these are different examples of how we can engage in community-based participatory research um, by um, thinking about how we sustain our work, thinking about how we design the studies from the front end, really planning for that, and then um, really giving feedback, interpreting research findings. So across each component of the research process, engaging with communities so that we make sure what we're doing is um, relevant to the folks that we're trying to support and help. And then um, lastly, just thinking about the contextual level, again, I'm thinking advocacy. Um, this is the recent uh, health advisory on social media use in adolescence that was put out by the American Psychological Association. And um, this was a nice way in which uh, science that we know was able to be put out to help um, uh, folks in the community. So helping to advise on how we use social, me social media um, in a in a healthy way. And um, this advisory was shared um, by um, CDC, by um, the Surgeon General there. So it, it was a way in which we took our science that we know and brought it into the policy realm so that it could actually make a difference for, um, for folks, for families and um, young people. So I'll end on research um, and I'll share with a specific research study that um, I worked um, as a PI with, with my collaborator, Dr. Katie Howell. Um, and this, this research study really took this multi-level approach in one study to look at um, different uh, multi-level outcomes, specifically on a strength-based perspective. And I'll talk about that. Um, I just wanna acknowledge all the amazing community partners who we engage in this work with um, uh, to really, again, think about adversity and equity, but from this multi-level approach. So um, just to give you a little bit of background of what this study focused on, um, we looked at the SAVA syndemic. So syndemic theory is a framework for understanding how health and social conditions interact and cluster and lead to worse um, outcomes for certain populations. And what we know is that structural racism, so again, using that system-centered language, is one of the drivers of disproportionate health epidemics within black and brown communities. And one of these ways in which it shows up um, has been uh, through syndemics. So 
pandemics are the um, the co-occurrence of substance substance abuse, substance misuse, um, violence, and AIDS and HIV. And um, these these conditions tend to cluster, and we see them clustering particularly in um, lower income um, BIPOC communities. Um, and um, we know that structural structural racism is one of the factors that facilitates the conditions for syndemics to occur. So they're often similar um, co-occurring factors like higher rates of poverty, lower access to healthcare, et cetera, where you see these things cl clustering. And so they impose an excess burden um, on families and communities. So in this study, we um, looked at 263 caregiver and child dyads in the Mid-South US. Um, youth range in age from eight to 17 with an average age of 12. Um, you can see the racial distribution and gender distribution of the young people. Most of our sample um, were black and we had more girls in our study. And caregivers, um, the eligibility criteria to be in the study was they had to be English speaking. They had to be the primary maternal caregiver, which ended up being about 97% of the sample were biological mothers. Um, mean age was 36 and about 80, almost 83% were um, non-Hispanic Black, self-identified as non-Hispanic Black. Um, about 50% were currently employed and the average um, annual income per household was um, was that should be less than I'm sorry less than fifteen thousand a year. So this was mostly folks who were experiencing high rates of um, poverty. Um, when we looked at our Sava endemics, you can see the distribution where about eighty um, eighteen percent of folks had a, a positive HIV test. Um, for forty nine percent had endorsed substance use in the past six months, significant substance use, and 50% had endorsed intimate partner violence um, in the past six months. So folks were really exp experiencing high rates of SAVA. Um, we collected a range of measures. Um, so this study, we really wanted to, we're, we're looking at folks who are exposed to SAVA, but we were really interested in resilience in their kids. So taking that strength-based perspective, where most folks would look at adversity and look for how folks were not doing well. We wanted to understand what, what would be the factors associated with the young, with the kids of these moms that were doing well. Um, how could we learn from them about what resilience factors uh, and supports that they had? And so this is a list of the different resilience measures. We also um, examined the resilience measures across um, this, using this multi-level lens. So we looked at resilience factors at the individual level, so things like social competence and um, personal resilience. We also looked at it at the relational level, looking at things like parenting practices and interpersonal resilience. And then for contextual, we broke this up into cultural and community. And at the community level, we looked at the types of community resources that folks had and then community cohesion or feeling connected to one's community and neighborhood. And on the cultural level, we looked at things like cultural resilience and ethnic identity. So these were the variables where we, we looked at resilience in youth of moms who were exposed to SAVA endemics. The SAVA measures um, that we looked at were intimate partner violence severity. Um, we um, using the CTS2, we used um, the substance use severity who assist and then asked about their HIV status. And um, again, all these families were recruited from organizations that served folks who were um, experiencing these adversities. Um, for our data analytic plan, you can see here um, how, we, how we structured examination of the variables. So um, on the left-hand side in the green bubble um, are the SAVA endemics. So we looked at the severity of intimate partner violence, um, substance use severity, and HIV status. And what we did with our model is we wanted to create a latent variable because in the existing literature, many times when folks look at SAVA endemics, they look at it as a count variable. So looking at, do you, are you experiencing IPV or not? Or are you experiencing violence or not? Um, people look at different types of violence. We were specifically interested in intimate partner violence. Um, but people would look at, do you have violence or not? Do you have you used substances or not? Are you HIV positive or not? We wanted to make this latent variable so that we could understand um, 
um, because you could have people who had one violent experience or multiple violent experiences. And so we wanted to be sure that we could look at severity. And so just emphasizing that. So we made this um, latent SAVA severity variable. And then we looked at how that latent SAVA severity variable in the mothers influence resilience in the child across these multi levels. So individual level resilience, relational, community, and cultural resilience. And these, the um, subscales that I just described earlier on the right hand side, oh, sorry, on the right hand side in blue here describes the various um, variables that formed the um, different resilience levels. And then because the literature has shown um, that youth gender often affects um, how resilient shows up, we looked at moderation by youth gender. Okay, so what did we find? So at the individual resilience level, we found that when mothers endorsed less severe SAVA, so their SAVA severity um, level was lower, youth had higher resilience. So that there was a sort of burden, added burden of um, SAVA in the parent-child dynamic that the youth was having less um, uh, was having higher uh, individual resilience. Well, it's interesting that there was this gender moderation effect. So girls showed higher individual resilience compared to boys. So we found that there was this differential effect of gender. At the relational level, we did not find a significant um, association. So the SAVA, um, maternal SAVA and youth resilience was not significantly related. And at the contextual level, first looking at cultural resilience, we found that as mothers experienced less severe SAVA, youth had higher cultural resilience, um, and there was not a gender-specific effect. So when it came to cultural resilience, the um, protective effects or of, of um, less SAVA, the risk of less SAVA affected kids regardless of gender. Um, However, when mothers endorsed less severe SAVA, um, youth had higher community resilience, but this was particularly salient, salient for girls. So girls really showed um, higher community resilience compared to boys. Okay, so what do we make of this um, finding? So first is that resilience is a multifaceted construct. So when we're thinking about strength-based variables, it's really important to look at this multi-level um, perspective um, for these variables. Also, we created that latent variable because that allowed us to look at um, not just uh, resilience across levels, but also severity, like how SAVA severity impacted uh, multi-level resilience across those levels of the social ecology. The second is really thinking about strength-based intervention. So when we're developing strength-based interventions like those that are resilience focused, um, it's really important to consider unique supports that girls and boys may need in order to build their resilience. Because we found this gender difference where um, the effect looked different for boys and girls with different levels of resilience. So as we're thinking about multi-level, we wanna really have that in mind. And as a pediatric psychologist, I think about that it's really important for us in pediatric psychology to think about how we design our studies to really examine these multi-level factors and look at both risk and resilience. That is not enough to look, particularly among folks who are highly, um, who are experiencing high stressors like high poverty, um, that we want to make sure that we're not only telling stories of the problems and the difficulties, but that we're also thinking about resilience and how people are um, supported and overcoming despite having the, this, um, the high levels of adversity. Okay, there's my animation. Okay, so um, I'll lead us to our last section here and then we'll have time for questions, which is really thinking about how we can develop um, an implementation plan, thinking about PEAR and this multi-level factors. And so I'm really posing some questions for folks um, to think about as we think about um, implementation. So. Um, things for people to reflect on. The first is really what um, multi-level factors are folks examining or neglecting to examine in your pair work. So whether you're a practitioner, an educator, um, someone focused on advocacy or research, for um, us to take time to think about, okay, do I have variables at this multi-level um, level? Am I asking questions about families, about just the individual level, or am I thinking about relational and contextual? So you know, same for teaching, same for advocacy. How can we really think about multi-level work? And this is, you know, some self-examination, some of that critical self-reflection to look at 
you'll work to see where gaps may exist. And then the second question is thinking about what will get in your way of implementing um, having this multi-level sort of approach to your work. Um, What are some of the barriers that might be um, preventing you from putting this in your work? And how might we um, think collectively about ways to incorporate more of this multi-level factors? Because um, from the research example, you see how if we just looked at one overall variable, we would have missed some subtle experiences that families are, are having. And then the third is really thinking about what or who will help to implement these multi-level factors in your work. So if we were in person and in a room, this is where I would ask you to turn to a neighbor and talk about um, some of these questions and engage in some, you know, uh, thinking and and um, an accountability, having an accountability partner to really practice this in our work. But since we're on Zoom, I will leave, or on WebEx, I will leave you with um, time to reflect on these questions and think about it in your own work. And um, and yeah, and then we can move into, I think, uh, question and answers. But um, I'll just leave you with these questions and then end with a gratitude slide, um, just, um, wanting to express gratitude to the funders of this work. The um, research study that I presented was funded by NICHD um, and my my co-collaborator, co-conspirator, Dr. um, Katie Howell um, at University of Memphis. And then also just expressing gratitude to the adolescents, the um, young adults, the families who participate in our projects. Um, We really talked to families about difficult conversations and I'm always so grateful to families who partner with us and Um, help us think about uh, the questions we're asking, but also making sure we can do it in a way that they feel um, a sense of dignity and pride in in sharing their stories. And of course, the amazing students, graduate students, um, uh, undergrads and staff who help with collecting all this data and and making the work happen. And I have my contact information on here and I will, I think, pass it back to Kim. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Gets getting some clapping hands in the <laughs> in in our participant section. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to open this up for questions. Um, you can do this in two different ways. One would be to enter a question in the chat. Um, the other one would be to use the hand raising. Uh, so down at the bottom of your WebEx screen, you see a little hand. Um, so if you raise your hand, I'm going to change my screen so I can see everybody. Um, well, that didn't. You want me to stop sharing, Kim? Um, yeah, that might be helpful. I think we'll see more people if we, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and so while we're waiting for people to think about questions or type them in the chat, um, I will, I have a couple questions. So I will start asking one question and then, um, we'll see where we go from there. Um, so, um, I have a colleague that, um, has been doing work called citizen science, um, in trying to get, Um, people to be more empowered to do advocacy with their local officials. And um, I'm wondering if you've thought about that or done any of that work yourself, Um, because I know, you know, we as researchers can be advocates ourselves, and you spoke Mm -hmm. to that, but I'm wondering um, about, you know, ways to get the public to advocate for themselves and and teach them how to do that. Wondering on your thoughts about that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And you're saying, so not so much researchers, but also the public around advocacy with the public? Yeah, and us as researchers, like in our projects, you mm-hmm. know, potentially including this, you know, way of get, getting the public to advocate for something. So for example, you know, I do physical activity research and, mm-hmm. you know, maybe there's a sidewalk that's broken or something right well i'm not going to be able to get that fixed but you know if people in certain neighborhoods want something to happen so they can walk in their neighborhood then how could i as a researcher you know help people to advocate for themselves to get things in the environment or you know sort of the more systemic levels of of things fixed if they you know so i'm just wondering your thoughts about that yeah no that's great um i have a few things that come to mind one is um i think that uh you know, some of this work around cultural humility is um, this idea of critical consciousness and how we raise people's um, uh, thinking about their role in um, justice initiatives. Because I think about, you know, the oftentimes the it's like broken window theory, or you think about um, which sidewalks tend to be the, you know, the ones that are not um, walkable and um, 
who tends to advocate, whose whose voice often is heard around these things. And so I think as researchers, there are ways in which we can um, conduct, you know, as you're finding, for example, if you're doing qualitative work and hearing about people's experiences, like I can't walk in my neighborhood because the sidewalks are broken, because of safety issues, et cetera. Um, uh, a, a, a big part of um, work that we think about a lot as we're designing studies from the beginning is like, um, how will we disseminate our findings? So I, I can think in research where you're hearing about this, bringing this back to the community, say here are the things you told us are the barriers to engaging in physical activity. How could we think collectively as a group about how we might solve that? And there might be people um, in the room who have access or, or knowledge about how to petition your mayor or your you know local leader. And um, I think if as researchers, we do more of disseminating our science to the public in that way, that we can rely on community knowledge and strengths and gifts to do this work. Like it's not just on us, because I know I definitely feel um, it's tough for me as a researcher to go to lobby about this neighborhood's issue. But as a community, it's something that maybe we could do as a group. Um, yeah. And something I encourage um, my students are trying to do in our lab is to attend community meetings for different um, areas that we're working in so we can hear what are the pressing things that matter to people. So we're also designing our research um, around what matters to that community. So we're building mm -hmm. community trust. It becomes a two-way thing rather than as a researcher sort of giving that there's a way in which we can learn from communities about how to have these conversations. So um, I think it's really taking our science outside of our labs and out into the community and working in partnership um, to address things like this collaboratively. So it doesn't feel like one person's job to fix but release a community um, mm -hmm. effort. So, yeah. Thank you. So I don't see any hands raised, but feel free to um, unmute, mute. Oh, wait, there we see, I see one now, uh, Denise Paris. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the resiliency topic hit home hard with me, especially today, and I'm sure with if there was others in my group that were on this call, we're finding that um, we, we don't have resiliency within our own research teams to go out and build resiliency in the community. There seems to be, and I don't know where the when things started to change over, but resiliency seems to be a key topic of a deficit. And so is there, do you have any ideas as to how to train your current research team in resiliency so they for, therefore can take that out into the community? Because if they don't have it, they mm -hmm. can't give it. Wow, that's a beautiful question. Um, I think, I mean, I love that you're raising this, Denise, because I think many times we, we like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm also partial to this as a psychologist. Like, I have all these tools, but I'm not always the best at utilizing the tools. And so, I love this idea of bringing it to our teams and like some kind of in service or work around like raising awareness about. Um, what, where, where our resilience lies, like, you know, doing our own self-assessment for, um, for uh, resilience qualities that we're experiencing, resilience resources. So um, I, I didn't talk a lot about this, but, you know, in the past, we used to think about resilience as something within a person, right? Really, so if you think about that multi-level, we used to frame resilience as sort of an individual level factor, like people have it or they don't have it. Well, the newer definitions of resilience from Ann Mastin and Mike Unger is really thinking about resilience at that multi-level, like like um, I was explaining in the talk, um, that we're thinking less about something that a person sort of has, but more about knowing what you do and don't have and knowing how to get that resource and access that resource. So um, I think as a research team, um, if we're aware of where our strengths in where our resilience sort of strengths lie and where they don't, then maybe as a team, we can work together to sort of balance our, our um, abilities and skills and resources. Um, so I think the first part would be building awareness. So some sort of um, reflection tool, assessment tool to, as a group, as a research team, know where we are um, and, then, uh, and then figure out where the gaps are so that we can support each other in addressing that. But I, I mean, I would think that the same interventions that 
we would work with families that help to support resilience, like engaging community, social support, um, strengthening ethnic identity, um, centering these ideas and voices in our teams and saying this is an okay place to explore these things. Um, your framing about um, how can we put it out into the world if we're not addressing it within ourselves is really powerful and talking about that as a team so that, um, so that like, we're bringing the science back to us to use it within our with our within our own groups. So um, that's what I would say to that. But I think even just put, posing it to the team about where people are, and as someone who works with adolescents, this is something that families are talking a lot about since COVID. There have been all of these changes that have happened, and a lot of skills that have been lost, um, and are really folks are really struggling to bring back, even around social interaction, things that were sort mm -hmm. of we took for granted as natural mm -hmm. um, things that occurred, but like that piece of time in a young person's development is huge and folks are still struggling with that. So we see increased rates of mental health problems, increased mm -hmm. suicide, all of these things, because some of these resilient qualities that you're talking about, um, that you're raising, Denise, we're, we're seeing them show up, right? We have a whole slew of college students who did most of their school online. And so again, interacting in the classroom with others and it's, it's, um, it doesn't come as naturally as it used to. Mm. So um, I think a lot of it is the times COVID technology, um, but I, my, my, my suggestion for how we address this is really like head on and thinking about how we build it uh, and balance it within our team. If I could reach out to you at some point in jest, and this is, I'm yeah. sorry if I'm personalizing this to everybody else, it, um, for us, a tool to evaluate ourselves. Absolutely. Like what would that, I would greatly appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, be happy to. I think I, I have you. my contact info on the slide. I can put that up um, again, or maybe folks can put it in the chat so that folks have access. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, so we have a comment in the chat and then another hand raised. So uh, Carolyn um, Masika says, interacting with regional or national patient advocacy organizations is another mechanism to invest in our communities. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point. And I um, I sit on council for the American Psychological Association representing pediatric psychology. And I, it's just been a mind opening experience about just how much how much advocacy we do as researchers and scientists and how much we don't label it as advocacy and how much knowledge we have and we could share with folks who are coming up with ideas often not informed always by science. So I love this idea of um, for me, I've been learning about it from a organizational way to, to engage in advocacy, but I also love um, this idea of patient advocacy groups because many groups exist and have been doing this work for a long time. Um, and even for our conference uh, for the Society of Pediatric Psychology, we've been trying to um, bring more of that patient voice into our conference and, and br learning from patient advocacy groups about how to do this right, because they've really been doing it um, for a while. And some of my weight stigma work, um, there's often these great um, uh, coalitions um, that have been thinking about this and thinking about the best ways to get supports for themselves. So I really love that that about learning from patients, right, about how to do it. I love that. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, Marnie Pollock, uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Thurston, thank you so much for your talk. It was really helpful framing and eye-opening in so many ways. Um, I'm a new faculty member, just fresh out of grad school. and. Yay trying to think about how to how to do good work when our own systems as researchers make the good work hard um, and specifically around funding sources that require um, pre-established really top-down research questions research protocols um, and the difficulty that that creates in allowing for um, those authentic partnerships and collaborations to happen and emerge continuously. Mm -hmm. And wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can also continue to push back that. against those systems and, and uh, push our science forward. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful question, Marnie, and welcome to the welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I, I can give a personal, uh, uh, um, a personal story or example and, um, and also like zoom out a little bit, but I know like for me as an assistant professor starting out, 
I, I wanted to do this community engaged work. That's where my heart is. And I knew like because of tenure and all those things that to do it authentically and reach the university level criteria for tenure would not happen, <laughs> right? There was no way to do that. I did not want to go in Russian communities to do things that they weren't ready to do, that I wasn't ready, you know. So what one thing that I did that I got advice from was I published on publicly available data sets while building community. So I it took a little bit of the pressure, the publisher parish pressure off my back just a little bit. While I was engaging in community, I took my first faculty job in Memphis, Tennessee, where had, I had not lived. So building that community from ground up and learning people and like building trust within the community. So doing that work and allowing it to take the time that it did while also having access. I published a lot from Ad Health. There are other publicly available data sets. This is just a shout out to that. There's, you know, it's not always perfect. The variables missing as someone who looks at race and ethnic identity, oftentimes they don't include these variables, but you do your best with what is available while building these community resources. I think your the zoom out response is like, we need to change the systems um, and not you because you need to focus on, but those of us who have tenure and our full professors and stuff, it's really like us not forgetting how hard it was when we started. Cause I think sometimes mm -hmm. you make it through this, there's maybe a little bit of hazing, a little bit of forgetting how tough it was. And we sort of move on at business as usual, but it's for us to use our privilege and the power that we have to really push systems and help have people think differently about what's a what's a valid contribution. And to me, if you are changing communities and in communities, you know, one paper on that should be equivalent to like 10 papers on like data that's already collected, right? So part of it is being on tenure communities and doing those services so we can amplify and elevate those perspectives so that systems shift. I do believe systems can shift. Um, I do believe it takes collective, like a, a, a group. It does, it's not the majority, but you need a loud enough voice of folks um, talking about these issues, reminding people about these issues um, so that we change the systems. Because it, it's, mm -hmm. I think things have changed, but not quick enough and not to match what's happening in society. We're still like so far behind. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when I complain, my, my, um, my mentors will be like, you don't know how it was back in the day, which I get. And I have an eagerness for us not to be having these same conversations, you know, now. Like, I feel like we need to also move the needle. Like, so you can come in and say, wow, you're a community scholar. We welcome you. We love this perspective. We're missing that in our work. We know that people uptake interventions better when it's community engaged. We know that the solutions we come up with are better with diverse teams when communities are involved. So we know this on an intellectual level. Part of it is like, how do we implement this? Um, on a research level, and it's really like voices making it clear um, that it matters. And to the earlier question is like helping communities demand out of their universities. Like universities are, you know, enterprises um, that are in the community. And I think we don't always think about um, us as being community members and taking up, you know, footprint in communities. And so what is our duty to those communities in which we we are living and and that's part of the work at the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice where I'm associate director is really centering the communities and the, the 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 role that the university can have in helping support communities be stronger and better given that we have these resources available to us. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So we're almost out of time, but um, I'm going to use my prerogative to just ask one more question, which um, has to do with funding. So um, this is such important work, and um, so I'm wondering your thoughts about funders, and I know that you're, it looked like you on your last slide, you mentioned an R15 grant, yes. which is something that others might not be aware of, so yes, I just great. was wondering if you could just spend a minute or two talking about, you know, what that grant is and, and where else you, you know, you recommend people go for funding for this really important work. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. So, um, so the R15 is a mechanism through um, NIH that I really, really recommend, and it's often underused. So it's it's for universities that um, they look at how much uh, research dollars you bring into the university. So if you're at a big R1, you probably won't qualify for this, but there, um, so that's something you can ask your grant office if you qualify for R15s or not, but there- We don't as, at UConn, but some of the, um regional uh, schools in Connecticut might, and there may be, we might be able to partner with people that, you know? Yes, 
qualify. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. Even I got that. That was my first, um, my, as a faculty at University of Memphis and um, to even bring in Marnie's point earlier. So what we did first was apply for an internal grant. So I know my grant success have every grant, every NIH grant I've gotten was first a small internal grant. Um, and so while sometimes those are small monies and sometimes they're pain because they want you to do all these things, they are a really nice way to build a team and show like have really good pilot data, even if the results are not what you thought they would, they show that you've like worked as a team together, you've published together, um, and that really helps you be competitive. So we got an internal grant and then wrote that internal grant for the R15 and got that funded. Since then, Memphis is an R1, so they wouldn't even qualify anymore. But the idea of partnering with other institutions where maybe they don't have the infrastructure that UConn might have, but they qualify for that grant. You could be a co-investigator and work together and use that to build your team mm -hmm. and use that as a jumping off point for an R01 or a larger grant. So mm -hmm. I, I think there are lots of beautiful ways in which, again, if we think about community and these R1 university that might have a lot of resources, other schools that may not have the resources, you can leverage um, the, the infrastructure and resources for both places to really produce good science. Um, the other, Place I, I'm starting to look into a PCORI grant um, where they really think about partnerships, right? Like as a central part of the grant, those are good mechanisms. And then foundation, we've had um, some good luck with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who's funded some of our work around diversifying academic health sciences, which is another line of research that I do with um, Dr. Maggie Alegria at MGH. Um, and they've been really, um, they I feel like they're really supportive of once you have uh, a research that is that is um, makes sense for their portfolio. They they really support the researcher and like will have other opportunities to get funding. So so um, part of this work is like building relationships. And I I think that's something I was not taught a lot about. Like reaching out to your program officers, it feels like such a big reach, but it really matters because many times these institutes want to invest in the scientists. And so having a relationship with your program officer. Um, helps. It's not like a guarantee for funding, but it does help you to understand more of the mission of that institute or that organization and what they're looking for. So um, I just want to amplify, you know, reiterate that internal grants are great ways to build your team, show expertise, show that you've been working together um, as a jumping off point for larger grants, and then look to other funding mechanisms. One other one that I'll mention is the R25. That's a um, we have a grant right now around diversifying the HIV um, pipeline, so bringing more BIPOC folks to do HIV-related research, and that um, was funded through an R25, which is also a mechanism that I think is underutilized, and that usually is a training grant. But what is nice about this project, we're using an implement, implement, implementation science approach, is that we're the, stu the students who are part of the R25 are doing HIV-related research projects that we fund them. So it's sort of a way to you know, dip into doing research funded through this training mechanism. So, um, and we're engaging each student works with a community partner to come up with their research idea. So you can still, again, bring that community voice and use these non-traditional mechanisms. I think we often all want the R01 and that's the push from our institutions, but people want, NIH wants to fund people who have been funded, which, you know, so, any way you can build your CV, including the LRP. Like my, I would say my journey was getting the loan repayment program, which made me feel like, okay, I've gotten NIH money. It demystifies sort of the process a little mm -hmm. bit. And um, so looking at some of these mechanisms that we don't think about, okay, it's not funding my research grant, but it's building your case to say, I'm someone who has gotten external funding, who's been evaluated, mm -hmm. and it really matters. So putting that in your bio sketch, you know, talking about that, again, it helps reviewers see that you're a fundable sort of scientist and um, and then, you know, it opens you up for other opportunities and collaborations, so. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, this yeah. was a really wonderful talk and you can tell by how many people have stayed late. To, to <laughs> oh, stay the call. Um, I'm sure other people that had to leave would have uh, enjoyed staying longer too, but um, really appreciate you. Um, coming here and, um, you know, uh, I'll put a plug in. So UConn does have internal grants that people can apply for, for pilot funding. So just reminding folks about that. And um, 
I'm sure uh, your, your uh, contact information's in the chat if people want to reach out to you and uh, talk about collaboration. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Have a good day.